Hello. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, big thank you to the organizing committee, and thank you for giving me your time before lunch break. So um, for today's topic, I would like to say, talk a little bit about design thinking. Um, if that's a familiar term to you guys, maybe a show of hands. And how to be bold and get radical with the entire process, the mindset. So over there, you would be seeing that that's Bruce Lee. Um, he's obviously not playing ping pong. And that's the mindset I think we all need to be in. Do not play the game that everyone else is playing. Make it your own game. So, hello. I'm Poon. Um, I'm design director at Aleph. Hello. Okay. Um, on a daily basis, I work with like-minded people to craft what we call creative technology and experiences. Um, we believe in creating iconic experiences, and the only way to get that, I think John has touched on a few of those traits that we need to have is to always have fun. The first thing that you need to do on a daily basis, if this is work, you need to have fun. That's number one. Number two, I think um, inquisitive was the term John used. For me, I say that we always need to be a curious bunch. So one of the key cultures that we have in the company is to always be curious. And what do we mean about being curious? We ask the why. Why does it have to be this way? Um, we question every single decision that we make, and we talk about why the button is blue and not red, for example. And lastly, um, I'm a very hands-on design person. I believe that the craft, the attention to details, the ability to make something beautiful and yet functional is the key to go. So crafting iconic experiences through a good culture, and that I think by doing that, that's the only way to become iconic. So some of the work that we've done um, across different countries, the different regions, touch a bit on financial services, so that's MasterCard over there, um, ICICI in India. So again, when we get involved with such projects, we ask the why. Why do we do this? Um, what's in it for the business? It's not only about the user. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Staying curious and inquisitive throughout the entire process. And we also touch a bit on telcos, Stingtel, and also the airlines. So for example, a project like this, we would say, how can we make an adventure more exciting through this app? Or how can we take off anxiety from someone who is really new to travel? So again, being very inquisitive. And through it all, um, the tools that we employ on a daily basis, or I use on a daily basis, is always pen and paper in today's new school way. And always going back to the basics, the fundamentals that are line, shape, space, type, all the elements of design. And then moving forward into the principles where we talk about symmetry, repetition, how do we make something look balanced, what is composition. So all these um, ideas that we have needs to be executed, and these are some of the tools that I use on a daily basis. On top of that, we have Sketch, we have Photoshop, After Effects, we all know this. So prototyping, Envision, Notability, and some references which we have, uh, Designs Guide. And through it all, right, I think John also talked about this, you need to stay inspired, you need to be on the go, and you need that fire in your belly on a daily basis. And how do I get all this done? Um, firstly, do the things you love. Secondly, um, I have a personal trainer at home who pushes me the heck every day, keeps me inspired. Um, I do love my coffee. I do love my Guinness at times. And I think the best inspiration is having good conversations with like-minded people like yourselves in this room. So where do you get ideas? You talk to people. Uh, you, you live life. You observe things. And that's where I think inspiration comes from. And the last tool that I use quite a lot would be design thinking today. Now, maybe again, just a show of hands, who are the design thinking practitioners in the room? Um, who here knows what design thinking is? Cool, not so many, but that's fine. Let's get into what design thinking is. Um, 
So this is Natasha Jen, 99U, uh, a couple of months back, and the statement was quite a controversial one. It says, design thinking is bullshit. Some of you might agree, some of you might not agree, but I think that's subjective, and that's fine. Let's embrace, let's stay curious, and we ask ourselves, why did she say it was bullshit? So she talks about the designer having a trait, a, a gut feel, the killer instinct, and design thinking actually overrides all that through having too much research, too many methods, too linear. And that's, that's her point of view. Now let's see what else design thinking means. So I grabbed this off Wikipedia and it says, design thinking refers to creative strategies that designers use during the process of designing. So back in the day, design thinking was only for designers. Um, secondly is that design thinking is also an approach that can be used to consider issues, identifying pain points, for example, um, with means to help resolve these issues. More broadly, within professional design practice and has been applied in business as well as social issues. So what's happening is everyone is starting to adopt design thinking. And design thinking in business uses designer sensibility and methods to match people's needs, again, based on the users, to what is technologically feasible. I think uh, that's because we are in a digital age. A lot of products that go out are digital products. But is that what it is? So you're not sure, right? But what my point of view is, is that design thinking is not about a process. It's not about creating visual design. Actually, it's more from mindset of firstly identifying a problem and then finding a solution to that problem. And so that brings me to my first point, is that design thinking is not for designers. It is meant for everyone in the room. It is meant for engineers. It is meant for project managers. It is also meant for CEOs, MDs, and so on and so forth. It is meant for that chef who is cooking a beautiful dish. It is also meant for that nurse in SGH who is trying to do better in the world. That's my opinion of what design thinking is. So first point, it is not for designers, it is for all of us over here. And what it actually tells us to do is that it's an inquisitive mindset where you firstly understand the problem and come up with solutions in XYZ methods. So if you were to Google and look further in, that's what design thinking is. Um, they say it's a process where you do I don't know, I can't see that. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So that's basically, um, according to Google, what design thinking is. Let's take a step further and let's see what Nielsen Norman Group thinks it is, right? There is the empathize phase, where at first you talk to users, you do field research, um, you do qualitative, quantitative surveys, and so on and so forth. And based on that, you go to the next step where you define the problems, you define what the business objective is, what the user pain points are, and you define the constraints of a project. Uh, project managers in the room might say cost, time, and scope. We talked a bit about scope earlier. But there is also a different angle to it, right? There's always the soft side of things that John also talked about, love, passion, and all the other good attributes that we should have as design thinkers. Then you very quickly go into the room again, maybe in a workshop, and just hack out ideas where you conceptualize things, you draw stuff on the wall, you do mind maps, and you just get a ton of ideas that may or may not be applicable. Again, um, we are curious, we are, we are inquisitive, we are not here to kill those ideas, we are here to just put them on the wall and understand them. Then very quickly, you need to visualize those ideas because Unless it is made tangible, ideas are just ideas, post-it notes are just post-it notes, it is not the end result. It's a means to getting to the end result. And then testing it um, through design review sessions, through user validation, through usability testing sessions, all very good, sounds very nice. Works, right? And lastly, implement it, build it, code it, put it out, and then continuously go round and round and round this loop. So that, that's, in a nutshell, what design thinking, according to this diagram, is. Um, let's look at a different model of design thinking, and this was made by IBM, I think, 
very big in the news today. I think last week itself, they launched a video uh, with InVision talking about their approach to design thinking. Observe, reflect, and make. Now, what's the difference between the two? The difference is the visual. The steps in between are exactly the same. Because as you observe, you empathize, you discover, you talk to people, you do the research, and you learn things. Reflect is a different word for define, where, again, you sit down with those things, you get ideas, you do mind maps, you document everything on the wall, you have a deck, maybe you have some videos, and you have business objectives, user goals, user pain points. Again, pretty similar to Nielsen Norman Group, right? Just a different word where they grouped things differently. And lastly, you make. You draw the tangible, you make post-it notes, you make it tangible, you prototype them, um, you maybe create a box if it's a physical prototype, you create some service processes, you create working prototypes, Xior, InVision, Principle, and so on and so forth. You make it real. But that's pretty cool. And the reason why it's been proven to work is because IDEO has practiced it, Google has done it, uh, fashion industry is adopting it, startups are doing it, financial services, retail, giants. So everyone is doing it. And which brings me to my second point. If you are not doing it, maybe a good time to start, maybe a good time to think about it like that as you approach the next problem that you are trying to solve. But it has become the norm, right? It has become everyone's culture, maybe in this park as well, that everyone is doing design thinking. And that is now the baseline. So if you started it three years ago, great. But if you're doing it today, this is just the baseline. So my question to you guys is, how do we differentiate? How do we become the 1% and not the 99%? How are we unique? Because if everyone is doing it, how are we special anymore as industry practitioners? Because let's look at it this way. It basically looks like that, right? You empathize, you define, you ideate, you prototype, and you test. The company next door will be doing the same thing with a different framework or different wording or different color. It's going to say, you discover, you ideate, you create, you validate, you build. So, we're not quite different, are we? I mean, if you're not doing it, get started. If you are doing it, it's time for another shift in mindset where you start to be curious once again, you start to be childlike once again, and you start to inquire what else you can do to push this industry forward. And we ask ourselves why it's working just fine, right? Design thinking in my organization is working great. I don't have to do anything new. Um, but that's not what we became design thinkers to be, right? We want to be curious, we want to always evolve, and this is what we owe to the industry. This is what we owe to our clients. This is what we owe to our internal team members as well, because if a team member joins you, they'll get bored of the same old thing once you do it five times. Human habit. If I see the same things five times, I'll get bored of it. If it's something new and scares me, pretty cool. That's, that's a challenge. And I think um, what is easy today was once hard. So, my challenge to you guys would be, let's embrace the scary, let's try to drive a new way of design thinking that is maybe not those five steps anymore. What it is, not quite sure, but um, got a few teams to help guide our thinking. Firstly, uh, break the mold, right? Reject everything that you know of course, you have to know first in order to reject it, but reject it, try to question it, and see, how can I do this different from the guy next door? Deconstruct the process, because there is no one-size-fits-all. I mean, if, it, if that one process worked for five other companies, it need not work for you, because your team and your problem is different from the rest. You might be running a three-man team. 
trying to solve one big problem. So make the process bespoke. There is no one size fits all when it comes to this. Do not follow blindly. Try things differently because if we're doing the same thing every day, maybe we're getting the same results every day. Um, Natasha Jen, when she said design thinking was bullshit, made a very great point that when they were trying to solve a children's a kid's problem in a hospital, someone used design thinking to come up with the idea that they needed to include childlike illustrations there. And do we need design thinking to come up with that idea? No, it's common sense. So try things differently. Um, I encourage you to maybe try brainstorming outside of a room. Um, in a cafe would be too cliche. In a bar will be too cliche. But maybe try brainstorming at 6 a.m. in the morning when your dopamine levels are super high and when everyone is super humble and that's where the legends come out to play. Maybe try that. Um, Tim Brown, pioneer of design thinking, said one thing that really stuck to me. Instead of thinking what to build, build in order to think. And I deconstructed this, this sentence and thinking what to build sounds like a project brief. Sounds like there is time, there is cost, and there's a scope involved. Maybe we start building first and then thinking after that. Don't know. Right? No real answer. Every problem is different. So I tried to deconstruct and I, I tried to create a new framework that might work for me, it might not work for everyone. Again, because everyone else deals with a different problem, trying to solve something else. So why don't we create, uh, we inspire and create, pretty much like a hackathon thing. Before you do your next design workshop, sit down one day, split up into teams, create something first based on inspiration that you get. Inspiration can come from the form of other products outside. Inspiration can come from technology. Inspiration can come from just observing people. Do this really quick. Create something tangible. And based on that, uh, I believe that if you, the, the time you have something tangible is when you have more meaningful conversations in the room. For the design practitioners here, um, do you remember the time you tried to articulate an idea with just post-it notes? Very difficult, especially more difficult when there are senior people in the room, you will get hammered. Create something really quickly, and then start discovering from there. Maybe this is something we try. From that on, let's validate it. Um, again, it need not be a usability testing because it might be too raw for usability, usability testing. And back to what Natasha Jen was saying, Maybe it is an expert review, an expert analysis, where you do a design review in a room with the best people, again, maybe at 6 a.m. when everyone's dopamine levels are soaring really high. Maybe that's when you get the best ideas. And lastly, you refine it. You make it better because the end product takes time. Craft takes time to create. And based on all that, maybe you can build more relatable conversations that are easier to articulate in a room with other people. And that's where um, the first step into making something tangible. So that's the first thing. Secondly, um, I think he is all-time design thinker. He did not just do Kung Fu, he created his own thing. And for him, what he said was to adapt what is useful, like those five pillars, take what is useful for you. Reject what is useless. I mean, if it doesn't work once, get rid of it. Don't, don't even stick to the textbook. Be street smart. And lastly, add in what is specifically your own, because at the end of the day, you are, it is your challenge, your problem to solve. Own it. And what he says is that now every project is different, every team is different again. If, be like water. If I put you in a cup, be a cup. Put you in a teapot, be a teapot. In other words, be street smart, read the audience, see what's working out, see what is not working out, and then move quickly, right? Don't stick to the slides, don't stick to the textbook. So keep your eyes on the price, that's what I'm trying to say. At the end of the day, we are not delivering user personas, sorry. We are not delivering uh, strategic documentation. What we are delivering, again, is a solution for a pain point. Keep your eyes on the price.
there can be too much research. Have you ever had that um, you go away for three months, you do too much research, you have a, a deck this thick with bar charts and pie charts and data grid, and you do not know what to do with it, right? You confuse yourself with too much research. Now, I love research. It's a good way to get insights, but again, um, keep it simple, get rid of all that complication, and keep it really simple so that you and the team can digest it in small bite-sized pieces and create the end product. Focus on the end product. Um, maximize efficiency through everyday hacks. Uh, my opinion is if it took you one hour to do task A, in three months, you should finish it in 15 minutes. Right? What seems easy today was once hard. Do it. Thirdly, if this is your design process right now, again, as design thinking practitioners, not designers, everyone in this room, you need to simplify it for yourself. You cannot hang on to something like that. And what needs to happen is you need to convert that process and simplify it so that time is maximized, efficiency is maximized, so that you don't do three months on research, you maybe can finish it in one week. Now, that's where I think industry needs to move. That's where you will be the 1% and not the 99% outside. Lastly, um, you need to get past the post-it notes. Yes, it's fun putting post-it notes on the wall. Yes, it's fun creating keynote slides, but you need to focus on the end result. I mean, no idea works unless you do the work. It's not going to happen unless you pick up or you and your team pick up Sketch, create a few mock-ups, make it tangible, prototype it, put it in front of someone else. It's not going to happen automatically. And maybe it's a good skill set to have, and you do not need Sketch to do all that. You can just pick up a pen, a Sharpie, paper, and draw things up as the first step. Right? Do not get hung up on post-it notes. Do not get hung up on big decks. Doesn't work doesn't deliver. And lastly, uh, my last theme of the day is to maximize efficiency. And I've just put a few hacks together to do that. Um, we talked about workshop facilitation, which is great, right? You need a design thinking leader, or what we call a facilitator in a room, to help guide towards a vision. Um, imagine if we put everyone into a room without this guide, and who makes decisions and moves people along, nothing's going to happen, right? Get someone with all the characteristics, being humble, being curious, being inquisitive. Get someone there and someone who can just drive conversations and just help inspire ideas. Always good to have. Don't do it blank. Um, set the right environment. Time is important. Imagine if you were doing a workshop session after lunch, everyone is sluggish. Time is important. Do it early in the day. Again, I'm going to say this for the third time now. When your dopamine levels are high, scientifically it is proven that people are more energetic and that this energy breeds energy and better ideas come out. Do it early in the day. Supplement it with coffee. Whatever rocks your boat, do it. That's how you become the 1% not what everyone else is doing. If you need to get the right people in the room, it does not only have to be designers, you can get subject matter experts. And we talked about empathy, right? Puts, if we are building something for a cripple, for lack of a better word, get someone with similar mindsets in, uh, empathize with them, learn from first-hand experiences if possible, otherwise use a proxy, right? So people is important, and these people need to be optimistic. They should not pull down the energy in the room. Third one would be place. Again, um, try brainstorming in a park. Try prototyping in a bar. Do something different. It might affect the outcome. And the, the big keyword I think came out from the talk before that as well is energy. Energy, energy, energy dopamines, 
it will change the work that you do. It will bring you from 99% to the 1%. So, a little bit of a framework here on how to build that energy. You start really early, you do micro wins. Who here gets really hyped up when they close emails like boom, 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 boom? Who gets energy from that? No? Okay. <laughs> Um, for me, it works because as I am closing out these small, small little tasks in the morning, it is setting me up to rock when I pick up the tools and start designing. Uh, it might be as simple, psychologically, they say, why do you need to make your bed in the morning? Because it's setting you up for success. The more micro wins you do, the more success you will have throughout the day. So start early, build, build up that additional energy. Now imagine if five people, like-minded people, do that and they come together for a brainstorm session at maybe 9 a.m., 10 a.m. in a beautiful cafe when there's like nice jazz music running. That is where, uh, I think we have seen it happen many times before, that is where the perfect storm happens. What is the perfect storm? It is where like-minded people full of energy, optimism, humility, coming together to play. And the, the consequence of that play is normally great ideas. Now, if you run this kind of a team on a daily basis, and if you run this kind of a design thinking process or methodology on a daily basis, think about the kind of work that you will be creating. Think about the kind of impact that you will be doing for the industry. Think about the impact you'll be doing for the clients, and think about the impact you will be doing for yourselves and your colleagues at the same time. Magical. And right after that, um, we need to execute. So if we think about this as the morning, do it really fast, don't do it the entire day, right? And execute it. And once you have run out of that magical jazz or, or whatever you call it, set up for the next day. Don't burn yourself out. Because, again, as design practitioners, we come to work to do this. We love the work. We focus on the craft. And at the end of the day, we need to heal as well, right? For the next day. So, set up, ramp down, and set up for the next day. And lastly, um, again, a principle that I hold really near my heart is that if you're not having fun in the process, if you're not loving the process, if you're not loving what you do, it means nothing at the end of the day. And we all became design practitioners, design creative people, strategic thinking, because we want to do something that's fun, we want to make impact. And do it, otherwise it means nothing. So brings me to a few key points that I want to make uh, once more. Design thinking is not bullshit, according to me. Design thinking is for everyone. It is not for designers. It's for the developer, the project manager, the CEO, the mom, the dad. Imagine if you practice this, you will make a difference in what you do. Do it if it's hard. Go against the grain because if you're doing what everyone else is doing, forget it. It's not fun, right? Do it till it gets easy, and then do something new. Because what's easy today was once hard. Keep it efficient. Don't let get lost in the research. Don't get lost in the details. Um, it might happen, but that's where you need that clarity of mind to just get out of it and say that, let's make a decision. We were the experts. We are the experts. Let's make a decision, and let's move on and see if it works or not. Right? Failing fast. Right? Don't sit on an idea for three months. It doesn't work. Sit on it for three hours. Make something after that. And lastly, focus on making. Um, too many things happen. People are focused on delivering user personas, affinity diagrams, bull's eye diagrams. Good tools. I love those tools, but they are just tools to help you get to the end. Focus on the end solution. Focus on solving the problem. That's what started the project in the first place, right? So I leave you with this and say, um, I encourage you to
to be bold and get more radical in your daily jobs? Thank you very much. Any questions or ideas came out from that? Tell me. Hi, so uh, a bit of context. Uh, I'm not myself a designer. I work in product stroke project. So my day-to-day -day job is actually making peace between my designers and my developers. Okay. You know, stop, stop them from killing each other, etc. So with that in mind, so my question to you is you, you mentioned that everyone should be doing design thinking, not just the designers, but also the, you know, the CEOs, the devs, people Correct. like me, etc. So do you think there's any value in saying that by the same measure, actually designers themselves should actually be doing a bit of technical thinking, or at least implementation thinking, to empathize with developers on you know, stuff like whether things can be done, it's feasible given legacy code, legacy database, legacy, dare I say it, processes. Uh, and if so, or if not, um, what do you, with your team, actually do to make sure that the great designs that you come up with don't come unstuck at the final phase, implementation? Some technical team says, super design, but we can't do it. How, like, how do you make sure it doesn't happen? Okay, um, a, a few things to that. Now, designers and developers having a war. Old school story, it exists. Now, strategic thinking, creative thinking, and the, the mindset of problem solving should be within the entire team. Uh, that's one, right? The team should be able to align on a singular vision that will solve all this extra friction. Now, that, that's number one. Number two, how do we make sure that Timeline is not impacted. Cost is not impacted, right? Efficiency. Don't spend three months creating all these little design specification documents, red lines, you know? Don't spend time on things that do not matter, in my opinion. Quickly get things down, get your hands dirty, create something where you can actually have better meaningful conversations and involve the engineering team in that process as well. Uh, the moment we start early in the day and we draw something out and we have a conversation around it, that will actually, in my experience, reduce the friction that happens. Uh, it's only when the fights mainly happen when deadline is tomorrow, I give you this mock-up and I say, change, change five things, that's when people get pissed off. So start early and plan backwards, maximize efficiency, don't don't, don't dwell on things that do not matter. Because at the end of the day, the developer is not going to use that user persona diagram to create the end product. Assuming it's a digital product that you're talking about. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, the, the slide that caught my attention is the slide on the ver uh, various design thinking framework or variation, right? Um, any thoughts on why IBM had to come up with another, why they saw a need to come up with another variation of design thinking? Yes, um, and it comes from the sense of pride and, and there's one statement that we have as uh, people who are into our craft, right? We need to make it our own. Now, it's not a bad thing what they did. They, they created this new loop mentality and they are able to use this as an idea to drive change within the organization. Again, keeping in mind, IBM is a 100-year-old company. Design thinking is just a new discipline over there. Now, something like this serves as an idea, a vision that people can rally around. So I think, in my opinion, my humble opinion is that it's a good visual, and it's, it's, it's a way that people can see and make it their own and feel proud to own it. Does, does that, to follow up on that, does that imply that the rest of those variations uh, seem to be lacking in the loop thinking, if you will? It, it, it lacks branding. It lacks branding. So the loop had branding. And branding works. Branding rallies people. 
uh, and once people are rallied and once people believe, that's when again the perfect storm happens, it's magic. So the rest of those diagrams, they look like one another and that's why it lacked a sense of identity, you know. Basically that. But in terms of the content, what I'm saying is there needs to be more than just branding. It needs to change. The content needs to change. It needs to become, if we want to continuously innovate this discipline, we need to continuously throw away what we already know. Those five steps, six steps, condense into three. And maybe say that we, we flip it, work in, work in reverse. Again, uh, it's not tested, not proven, but the mindset is that we need to adopt something new in order to be the 1%. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. And uh, like you're a very energetic person, and it all sounds great that like you come to the office and you have this energy and you translate it into design. Um, I don't know, maybe it does not happen to you, but probably to many designers it happens that sometimes you have those days when there's no ideas, you feel completely drained and mm -hmm. uh, you don't know what to do. So how do you tackle such situations and what kind of advice we would give to other designers? Okay. Um, the, okay, in old school terms, that's a designer's block. It will happen to everyone. It's the norm. Mm -hmm. Don't get put down. Now as design leaders, as we are walking in, we need to have Again, deconstructing the process, right? Using design thinking, we need to have a solution to that problem. And the solution could be as simple as just huddling up during morning stand-up if you're practicing agile. And you give a gratitude to them. You, maybe you just give a round of gratitude because when you are giving gratitudes, that's when positivity comes out. Say, thanks for what you did yesterday. And, and maybe we, you do a session of gratitudes. Or maybe you just brought a coffee there. Maybe you said, stuff it, it's Friday, let's have a morning beer. Now, that's, that's the fluff part, right? That's the soft part. Now, in terms of solving design problems, uh, more of a graphic designer kind of way, research comes in. You need to rally teams around research that is uncomplicated. It needs to be synthesized into insights. What you need to do for the design team is provide them with inspiration, clarity, and lastly, empower them um, through the different approaches that you, you might have. Coffee could be one. Two, if they are stuck on, a, on art direction, the answer would be to do some mood boards. If they are stuck on a layout, maybe it's to do a sketching session. So there are multiple design uh, exercises to solve different needs. So maybe if, we, if you had something more particular in mind, we could take it offline as well. Um, hello, yes. Um, I'm just wondering, um, because I do a lot of hiring, and a lot of times uh, when I interview and I'll talk to developers or designers and things like that, they usually are very concerned with, um, well, it's not much more of a challenge anymore to their previous company, and that's why they're looking for other companies to okay. have the challenge. So as a startup business, how would you want to um, position yourself so that uh, they can be sustainable to our company and committed to our company uh, and also you know to get inspired uh, instead of just maybe like a, you know like a period of one you know three months and then they just hop onto another company mm. how, how would you do that okay in the first place um, it's I do a lot of interviews as well and the first thing that they say as interviewees is that I want a bigger challenge. That's what everyone says. Half true, half not true. I think that's where your soft skills come in, and that's where you read the person itself, right? Uh, that's one thing. Second thing is, I'm not sure if you're talking about designers and developers or just people in general, but I think we are both looking for people with drive, people with that fire in the belly, people who love the craft, love the work, you know, and it's a gut feel sort of thing. But one thing that's been working for me personally is that the people I work with, people with that fire in the belly, they love big challenges. And big challenges sometimes does not end at 6 p.m. 
And if that person decides that I want to do it post 6 p.m., we need to respect that because that's how we cut our teeth at first. That's how we actually learned through the art of doing. And it's not always hunky-dory, easy. You know, sometimes we just need to put in the hours, go against the grind, and that's where I think people with that fire in their belly, that's what they want and that's what they're looking for. And at the end of the day, that's where the growth actually happens. They go from 99 to the 1%. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Poon. Now we would like to um, show appreciation to Poon.